Hello, this is Tamara Linkowski, and I'm making a video and titling it, um, Can a Person Profess to Be a Christian and Have No um, Lifestyle of Giving? And um, I'd just like to share some verses and things that I've read and what the Lord has showed me. I'm making this video, friend. I, when I make a video, it's what God lays on my heart. And I'm not saying... I know it all because none of us know it all. We're never going to understand all of God's word before we get there, you know. But at the same time, um, I think there's a lot of uh, what the Bible would call defiled religion out there. And defiled religion is not the same thing as undefiled religion, okay. There, there's a reason God says pure religion and undefiled before God is this. And then he tells us what it is. And there's a reason where, why um, Paul says this is the true grace. You know, why would Paul say this is the true grace? He says that because, um, do we say that about toilet paper? Do we say this is genuine toilet paper? This is genuine paper towel. We don't say that because the only kind of toilet paper there is is genuine toilet paper. The only type of um, paper towel there is is real paper towel. But we do say this is genuine currency, right? We say that because there is such thing as counterfeit currency. And Paul says that this is the true grace because there is a true grace and there is a counterfeit grace. And there is a, um, in James one twenty seven, it talks about pure religion undefiled because there is a defiled religion and there is an undefiled religion. And that's why I'm titling this video, Can You Be a Christian and Not Give? James 1.27 says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. So there's two things that God talks about that he calls religion undefiled. He says, You are in an undefiled religion and honoring God when, number one, we visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. And number two, we keep ourselves unspotted from the world. So what would defiled religion be? Well, defiled religion would be not visiting the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and not keeping ourselves unspotted from the world. So, for example, I could be going to church every Sunday. I could appear to be living this holy, godly life in front of the world. But if I have no desire to give, if I'm just tipping my hat to God, you know, oh, here, I'll throw 20 bucks in here and 15 bucks there. I'm not, now I'm not saying that that's, you know, for some people that's a lot. And the Lord sees that the widow gave two mites. But the difference is the widow gave all she had. God saw that was all she had, and she sacrificed it all for the Lord and his work. You know, and then there's other people that are millionaires that will drop, you know, just some change in there, and that's just tipping your hat before God as if God needs that. God doesn't need that. He doesn't need that. And um and he wants all of us, but I don't want to get ahead of my notes, so I just want to share with you what God's laid on my heart. I'm going to say a quick prayer also before I begin. Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for life and breath and truth, Lord. Thank you that you are the way, the truth, and the life, Lord. And without you, we, will, we do not have the way. And without you, there is no truth. And without you, there is no life. We're just dead men walking. So thank you for giving yourself, Lord. Teach us to be like you and give ourselves as well. Bless this time now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, I pray that this video is going to whet your appetite to get the book Radical by David Platt. Um, it truly has changed our lives, my husband and I. And I'm going to... Um, I'm going to share with you, I'm going to read just some of what he said because you, I've said before I tend to get long-winded. But I want to read to you what David Platt says and how, um, how we are so religious today and yet our religion is so defiled, so defiled. It's just sad. It breaks my heart. And that was me. So I'm not preaching anything God hasn't already laid on my heart, but... 
you know, praise God, I can say, I don't believe that's me today. Not that, not that every area of my life, I'm sure God will reveal some areas that are still defiled, but the more God is revealing, the more I see how wicked I am and how much I need to change and I repent and then God is changing me. And I, I just get so excited about what God is doing. It just makes me cry. That's all I can say. It makes me want to do more because I see he, he brings it to light, the wickedness in me. And then I repent and he changes me. And then I'm more like him and I do more. And he blesses the fruit of my labor. And I see what he's doing and it just, I, I just can't stop being amazed. So anyway, this is what David says um, about giving. And um, he relates it to a man who is living in adultery. He says, some might think this is taking it too far. He went on and gave many verses on how God pronounces severe judgment on those who are rich, but not rich toward the work of God. And if we live in America, we are among the richest in the world. Believe me, when we stand before God, we are not going to have an excuse as to why we didn't give. Some might think this is taking things too far, but consider another scenario. Imagine a man who claims to have Christ in his heart, but indulges in sexual activity with multiple partners every week. When he is confronted by scripture about his sin, he nevertheless continues in willful sexual immorality. He disobeys Christ persistently with no sign of remorse, contrition, or conviction. So is this man really a Christian? Of course we are not this man's ultimate judge, but when we look at 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10, and it says, neither the sexually immoral nor adulterers will inherit the kingdom of God, we would certainly question whether this man is really a child of God. And also the Bible does say we will know them by their fruits. So let me keep reading. It is not that he needs to stop his sexual immorality to be saved. That would mean he would need to earn his salvation. And friend, anybody that's watched my videos knows I do not believe in a work salvation. That's not what the Bible teaches. The, but the Bible teaches a salvation that works. So um, I don't believe you can quack, 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 and one day you're going to become a duck. That's work salvation. But if you watch ducks, you will see them quacking. And they quack because they're ducks. And that's the difference. Because they're ducks, they quack. Because we're Christians, we work. We don't work to earn it. We, we, we're Christians. And so because God has transformed our hearts and we've become new creatures in Christ, we are going to automatically desire the things that Jesus desires. We will hate the things God hates. We will love the things God loves. And if that's not us, then just because we appear godly on the outside means nothing. It means nothing. You know, I can, I can continue to, you know, appear that I'm in love with my husband and I don't lust after other men. But if deep down I am living a life of lust and, and every time I look at somebody I'm ripping their clothes off in my mind, Jesus wouldn't be doing that. I, I would seriously question myself. Am I really a Christian if this is my, li my lifestyle? This is how I'm, I've been living and I've been professing to be safe all these years? God still hasn't delivered me? You know, something is wrong when, when we have been Christians for 15 years. Something is wrong when a child is 18 years old and still in kindergarten. We don't expect a person to be 18 years old and still in kindergarten, okay? We expect them to be graduated from high school. And it's the same thing with the Christian life. Every year, God is growing us. Now, we're not all growing at the same rate, but we should all be growing. And there's a problem if I'm still battling these um, little battles and uh, questioning things that, you know, questioning is one plus one, two. And I've been a Christian for 15 years. There's a problem with that. And so, you know, I, it's not for me to judge you, but it's for you to sit down and examine yourself. You know, if you're just a baby Christian, I mean, when, when I was a baby Christian, I went to the bars telling people about Jesus. 
because I didn't see anything wrong with going to the bars. God knew that. Eventually, God, you know, laid on my heart, okay, it's time to separate yourself from them. You can reach these people with the gospel in another way because had I not done that, I would have probably fell back into it and not be living the life I'm living today. Okay, I need to keep reading. That would mean that he would need to earn his salvation. No, this man needs to trust in Christ, which will result in a changed heart with a desire to obey Christ in every area of his life. So what is the difference between someone who is willfully indulgent in sexual pleasures while ignoring the Bible on moral purity and someone who willfully indulges in the selfish pursuit of more and more material possessions while ignoring the Bible on caring for the poor? The difference is that one involves a social taboo in the church and the other involves a social norm in the church. And it's sad, friend, but you know what? That's exactly what the Lord is going to say to us one day. We look back on slave, owners, slave owning churchgoers of 150 years ago and ask, how could they have treated their fellow human beings that way? I wonder if followers of Christ 150 years from now would look back at us Christians in America and ask, how could they live in such big houses? How could they drive such nice cars and wear such nice clothes? How could they live in such affluence while thousands of children, thousands, millions, uh, were dying because they didn't have food and water? How could they go on with their lives as though billions of poor didn't even exist? Is materialism a blind spot in Christianity today? More specifically, is it a blind spot in your Christianity today? Friend, I, I get so convicted when I, when I read this because here we are, and I'm telling you, if you watch my other videos, we are a living testimony of seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and he will add all these things unto you. You know, that, that's a whole, and I've made a testimony in my video. You can just go and look at it, but God is faithful to his word, and he blesses his ways. He's not blessing me because I'm some godly person god knows apart from the jesus that's in me there's nothing good in me you know i just watched this movie um it's called give me shelter and it was a great movie and i can't tell you um i don't think i've ever cried so much in a movie in my life and if you i don't think i've ever said in my youtube videos but abortion is very near and dear to my heart because um first of all had i not had was i not saved and had i gotten pregnant i would have had an abortion so I can relate to these women. Second of all, my last pregnancy, I had five doctors tell me to abort my baby. So my kids and I, we go to the abortion clinic every Friday morning and try to convince moms and dads to change their minds. And the Lord has been working there. So this movie, Gimme Shelter, is about a woman, about a girl who just lived in a horrific environment and finds herself pregnant and nowhere to go. However, um... Now, this is not a Christian-based movie. It is based on a true story, and I, I do not want to demean the movie at all. However, as Christians, okay, um, we can give, but if we're giving and we don't tell give the gospel along with that giving, we're still going to send those people to hell. I mean, if I go out there to the abortion clinic every Friday and I try to talk to a mom about um, about saving her baby honestly if she aborts that baby that baby is better off that baby is with the lord but if i don't give this mom the gospel and teach her what the gospel is and how she's a sinner and without christ we're all destined for hell then um then i'm doing nothing but bringing a baby into this world that might not ever get saved that might not ever know christ so without giving the gospel and doing this work we are doing nothing but humanitarianism. Humanitarianism is not is not Bible. It's not godly. It's works without faith. <laughs> and that's what humanitarianism is. And that works without faith is going to send us to hell just like faith without works 
will send us to hell. You know, faith without works is what the Pharisees did. They told everybody how to live, but they themselves didn't live that way. They told everybody to give, but they themselves weren't giving. You know, they they raised the bar on everybody else except themselves. So neither one of them is right. But pure religion undefiled commands us to do both. We're to give and we're to be giving the gospel at the same time. And that's why when I go to abortion clinics, I give the gospel as well because we need to save these babies' lives, but at the same time, these babies and these mamas and these daddies need Jesus Christ. Because apart from Jesus Christ, there's no salvation. That's what the Bible teaches. Now let me go on and um, let me go on and share. Now, the, now he's talking about the rich man and Lazarus. I'm assuming everybody that um, watches my videos already knows the story of the rich man and Lazarus. So I'm just going to read what David Platt says. This story also illustrates God's response to those who neglect the poor. Now, this rich man had Lazarus at his doorstep and never did anything to help Lazarus. Lazarus just ate crumbs that fell from the master's table. That was The rich man was tipping his hat to Lazarus. Here he is living a life of full luxury and throwing crumbs to Lazarus. Now, now while I'm reading this, you think about how much you make and what your possessions are and how long it takes you to maintain those possessions and compare that to how much you give of your money, of your time, of your life. But this story also illustrates God's response to those who neglect the poor. He responds to them with condemnation. Again, the Bible does not teach that wealth alone implies unrighteousness or warrants condemnation. The rich man in this story is not in hell because he had money. Instead, he is in hell because he lacked faith in God, which would have led him, leading him to indulge in his luxuries while ignoring the poor outside his gate. As a result, earth was his heaven and eternity became his hell. Now I have to ask this question. When you hear the story of Lazarus from Jesus' mouth, with whom do you identify more with, Lazarus or the rich man? I'm sorry. When you hear this story from Jesus' mouth, with whom do you identify with more, Lazarus, who's the poor man, or the rich man? For the matter, with whom do I identify with more? In uncovering this blind spot in my life, now David Platt's talking about himself, God made it clear that I look a lot like the rich man in this story. Now this man is a pastor, pastoring a church of thousands, you know, um, and he's saying he identifies himself more with Lazarus. I don't always think of myself as rich. I'm guessing you may not think of yourself as rich either, but the reality is if you and I have running water, shelter over our heads, clothes to wear, food to eat, and some means of transportation, even if it's public transportation, then we are in the top 15% in the world of the world's people for wealth. And that's the thing. What does God command us to be content with? What does the Bible say? We are to be content with food and raiment. Not even a wardrobe. Just food and raiment. Not even a supply of food. You know, if we have food on the table for the next meal and clothes to wear, we're commanded to be content. And everything else is up over and above that is just extra that God has never promised us, has just blessed us with. Okay, I'm going to keep reading. I am much like the rich man, and the church I lead looks a lot like him too. Every Sunday we gather in a multi-million dollar building with millions of dollars in vehicles parked outside. We leave worship to spend thousands of dollars on lunch before returning to hundreds of millions of dollars worth of homes. We live in luxury. Meanwhile, the poor man is outside our gate, and he is hungry. In the time we gather for worship on Sunday morning, almost a thousand children elsewhere have died because they have no food. If it were our kids starving, they would all be gone by the time we set our closing in prayer. We certainly wouldn't ignore our kids while we sang songs and entertained ourselves, but we are content with ignoring other parents' kids. Many of them are our spiritual brothers and sisters in developing nations. They are suffering from malnutrition, deformed bodies and brains, and preventable disease. As most, we were throwing our scraps to them while we indulge in our pleasures here. 
kind of like an extra chicken for the slaves at Christmas. This is not what the people of God do. Regardless of what we say or sing or study on Sunday morning, rich people who neglect the poor are not the people of God. What are we building? What scares me most, though, is that we can pretend that we are the people of God. We can comfortably turn a blind eye to those words in the Bible that go on and go on with our affluent model of Christianity in church. We can even be successful in our church culture for doing so. You know, friend, I, I mean, I could go on and on reading this, but, but that's the problem. You know, we're going to stand before God, and God is going to... I just I just sat there and thought about this, okay? I was thinking about this, um, thinking about someone who does so much for the poor. You know, in Isaiah, I think it's Isaiah 64, 6, it says, um, all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags to God. Even the best of the best that we can do for God, God looks at it and goes, ah, filthy rags, filthy rags. <laughs> that That's just what God does. I mean, that that's how... That's how I see God seeing my works apart from Christ. That's why God looks at humanitarianism and says, ah, filthy rags, filthy rags, because none of it is being done. All that good works is being done for some other motive. I'm not going to judge their motives, but the motive is not exalt Christ and glorify him. And if that's not our motive, then it's all defiled. It's, it's unrighteousnesses that are compared to filthy rags. And that's what all our works are apart from Christ. That's what I am apart from Christ. You know, I people say sometimes look at our family and talk about how we appear godly or whatever. And God has changed us. I do not want to diminish that at all. But apart from Christ, if God removed his grace from me and my life, I could be Osama bin Laden. I mean, I could be Hitler. I could be Ted Bundy. I could be any of those people. You know, I I cannot even imagine what I could be if the Lord didn't have mercy upon me and pour his grace out on my life. And that and that's the problem, you know. Um one of the things the other verse that I think about is Jesus said, "I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves." Jesus is sending us out in a dangerous place. You know, when I when I go to that abortion clinic, I tell you what, there are battles with demons and then there's other battles. And um, I honestly feel like I'm in the front line battle with Satan himself. And although I'm a post-trib rapture believer, if you've ever watched the um, Left Behind movies and you know that Nikolai is the... Um, antichrist in those movies and you see how smooth he talks and how peaceful he appears to be but how wicked he is on the inside that's what it what that's what it my experience is when I talk to those people in the abortion clinic and and I pray for them and I've prayed for the doctor and the workers and I've even had opportunities to witness to them but when they come out and threaten to arrest me for being there I feel like I'm talking to Satan himself, the, the way they carry themselves, the way they talk, the way they try to put fear in me. But the more I pray and the more I read my Bible, the more God reveals his word to me, the more I realize this is what Jesus said. He is sending us out as sheep in the midst of wolves. And we're commanded to be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. We don't stop going because it's a dangerous place. I mean, then then I would care more of, about my own life than I would be caring about the work that God has called me to do, you know, and that's not right. And so um, we're not commanded to avoid danger. I mean, think about Jesus. Did he avoid danger? Absolutely not. He went right to it and gave his life for it because that's what the will of the Father was. So, um, and then think about another verse, friend. Matt, Matthew ten twenty eight, and do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul god says you know it's like it's as if god was telling me you know like i'm praying to god lord what if they and i did pray this i said lord what if they put me in jail what if i end up dead because of what i'm doing and it's as if the lord looked at me and said is that all i mean that's what this verse is saying is that all is that all you're afraid of that's not what you're to fear tomorrow 
Do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both the body and soul in hell. That's who I'm commanded to fear. I'm commanded to fear God. And my fear for God ought to be so great that if God says go, I'm, I'm going and I do go. And you know what that going does? That going increases my faith leaps and bounds leaps and bounds see friend this is my this is the, i have to tell you this before i keep reading some more i'm going to try to make this video under a half hour but th this is my problem with um you know and, and i don't want to condemn please again these are my thoughts this is what god has laid on my heart that does not mean what i'm saying um i'm condemning the those who have done this okay but i personally do not um am not in favor of uh, going to Bible college because I see a lot of people who go to Bible college for four years and then assume that um, they are qualified to be pastors. And if you read 1 Timothy 3 and the qualifications of a bishop, and then after you read those qualifications, it talks about the qualifications of a deacon. One of the things it says to be qualified as a deacon is that they may be tested and and be faithful, you know, the problem with Bible college is it doesn't test you, you know. Have you been tested where someone has molested your children and you can forgive them? Have you been tested where someone has um, threatened to kill you or has killed one of your children or, or your husband like Elizabeth Elliot and you can forgive them? Um, have you been tested where you have uh, gone and... Um, you know, you went on a medical mission to Africa and you got poked with a needle by an AIDS victim and, you know, and it accidentally poked you and you, you're still worshiping God. I mean, that's the problem. Bible college does not, cannot teach us to be like Christ in that area where no matter what anybody does to us, we're to forgive. Those are that that's where it talks about deacons must be tested we have to have gone through trouble trials and tribulations look at the apostle paul and what he's gone through he was beaten and he was tortured and he was stoned and all these things he was shipwrecked and all these things but he still remained faithful he still went and witnessed and he kept on witnessing and witnessing and he didn't look back he didn't hate the people that did that what did stephen say when he was being stoned, oh God, lay this not on their charge. What did Jesus say? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And the thing is, we can learn so many things in Bible college. And all that's going to do is hold us more accountable. I don't want to be held more accountable. I have so much right now that I need to apply. I need to apply what I know before I can even learn some more. And God, And in my life, God teaches me and then puts me in the fire. And then he teaches me again and then tests me, puts me in the fire again, teaches me again and tests me. And that's how it is even in, I mean, think about it, even in school, what do we do in school? We go through kindergarten and then we take tests and then we go through first grade and we take tests and we go through, and so it's okay. So Bible college is okay if we go through Bible college and then allow the Lord to test us. But if we just go through Bible college and then assume that that qualifies us to become a pastor or a teacher, I don't believe that's right because we've not been tested and we're not following 1 Timothy 3. And that's why for me, um, I have learned, you know, having been a Christian for over 15 years now, I read my Bible and live it. And I follow people who have read their Bible and live it. I don't just assume because this man is a pastor and has gone to Bible college that I can believe everything that he's saying. I don't even know if he's been tested unless I hear his testimony. So that's just one thing I wanted to share on the on the side. Now, what did Jesus say in Matthew 16, 15? Again, we're still talking about giving, but kind of going on tangents. But in Matthew, Mark 16, 15, he says, and he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, now friend, this is not an option. I mean, he's commanding us, go into all the world and preach the gospel. That doesn't mean just go in my community. And that doesn't mean just give. I mean, I mean, think of something. When God, when God decided to save us, what did he do? 
Did he send gold and silver? Did he send riches? When Jesus decided to save us, he sent himself. He sent the most near and dear precious thing to his heart that God the Father sent his son. And in the Old Testament, God commanded us to tithe. But in the New Testament, he commands us to give our bodies. He said, present your bodies a living sacrifice to the Lord. And he says it is only our reasonable service. You know, that's all it is, only reasonable in his sight. We're not doing something great in God's sight by giving our bodies. It's only reasonable. It's kind of like how a mother is expected to care for her children. People expect me as a mother to care for my children. That is only reasonable. And in the same way, as a Christian, it is only reasonable for me to give my body, let alone give my material possessions. and my. I mean, if I'm commanded to love my neighbor as myself, honestly, what does that look like? If I'm going to love my neighbor as myself, then I ought to be willing to give at least half of everything I have to my neighbor. That, that's just what loving my neighbor as myself would mean, you know? Now, how many of us do that? <laughs> do I do that? You know, so I pray that the Lord will use this video to challenge you, not, not just in giving. I mean, look at, look at um, uh, Zacchaeus in the Bible. Jesus said, I'm going to your house today, and he was a tax collector. And after he got saved, what did he say? He didn't say, I'm going to tithe. He said, you know what? I'm going to give half my goods to the poor, and anybody that I've cheated, I'm going to restore them fourfold. That's genuine salvation. Now, that doesn't mean that every born-again person has to give half their goods to the poor and restore fourfold. That's what God laid on Zacchaeus's heart. Now, my question is, what is God laying on your heart? But, friend, if you don't even have the desire to give, I mean... If you're living a lifestyle where every penny that you make has to go to provide for your needs, you got to ask yourself, am I really a Christian or am I just practicing what the Bible calls defiled religion? So I hope and pray that God uses this video to challenge each of us to ask ourselves, you know, to pray for God to put us in the fire that the dross might come up. Maybe this video was a big fireball and the dross is coming up. Please get the book Radical and read it. Um, Radical is by David Platt. You can find it on Amazon. And get the book Crazy Love by Francis Chan. That is a huge challenge to the lukewarm Christian. Those books both, are, in addition of course to God and His Word, but those books are filled with the Bible and His God's Word. And they that's why they changed my life. But, um, God used them to change me. I hope and pray this was a blessing. Please feel free to comment. My prayer, God, please, Lord, if, if I've said anything wrong, just erase it from anybody's memory. But I, I believe that what I've shared with you today is truth from God's word to challenge each of us to not focus on ourselves. You know, our life is like a big movie this big movie, like, you know, I, I don't know what movie to give you to think about. Just think about a movie and think about the main character of that movie. And think about yourself being just someone, some passerby walking the streets while the camera was rolling. You know, if that passerby walking the streets while the camera's rolling is only thinking about himself and his things and his needs, he's not going to do any good to the character of the movie to the main character and to helping out with this movie and that's the thing our life is supposed to be this big movie about Jesus and we're just this character passing by and so if I'm just this character passing by but I'm constantly focused on myself and my needs and what I want and what I need to do and I'm not focused on the main character of this of this movie that God has you know put me in then I have completely defeated the purpose of why God has even created me and why I'm here and my part of the movie. My part of the movie is to exalt the one whom the movie was created to exalt and glorify. And that and, and I pray that as Christians we can um we can live that. We can live a life such that people look at us and our life makes no sense apart from Christ. 
that people look at us and even if they don't believe in God, they look at they look at my life and say, "Wow, that girl is just I just don't understand how she's got all she has. None of it makes sense. The amount of money they make and what they have makes no sense. They're either stealing or they're or there is a God and he is pouring blessing on their life." You know, and that and that's the life that I pray that God leads each of his children to live. God bless you. Thank you so much for watching.